they say it's often a tension between yeah. you know trying to deal with the end of the world and the end of the month right <laughs> that is the front of people's minds understandably they're paying bills they're worried about their mortgage they're worried about you know their house being repossessed the climate thing fell away and it, it kind of fell into a ditch and it stayed there for a long long time and I think it has taken reality to put it back on the agenda again So you've probably heard the voice in that clip many, many times on radio. And whether or not you agree with everything he says, it is undeniable that John Gibbons cares deeply for this planet and is on an unrelenting mission to save it. He's one of Ireland's best known environmental journalists and commentators, and he is my special guest on this episode of Food Done Right. Hi, I'm Mick Kelly, founder of GIY, and this is season two of our podcast series, Food Done Right, which was recorded at the Harvest Festival in Waterford City. In this episode, Barry Flynn meets John Gibbons, the man behind the blog, Think or Swim, and a very familiar voice on radio shows like The Last Word with Matt Cooper on Today FM. And he's a regular columnist in national print media. John has been a tireless campaigner for environmental issues since the mid-2000s, long before it was cool. And in this conversation, they talk about how things have changed both for better and for worse over the last 15 years when John first became very involved. They also talk about our communication around climate and how that needs to be improved in order to change perspectives and encourage action. Before we kick into the conversation, I have a couple of asks for you. First of all, please do follow the series on Apple and Spotify. Hit that follow button and share it with a friend. It really helps us to spread the word with this podcast. Second of all, we've got a new TV series called Food Matters, which is available on the RT player and covers lots of the themes from this series. Check out the website foodmatterstv.ie for loads more information. So let's crack on with the conversation between Barry and John. So much has changed since John first became involved in climate change activism. So Barry started by asking John if he feels more positive now compared to when he first got involved. Yeah, I think there's a sort of a a race here, I suppose, between kind of awareness and things falling apart. I suppose that's the simplest way I can think of this. And yeah, when I started, which is probably somewhere between maybe 15 plus years ago. At that time, um, yeah, there were very few people in the space talking about it. And uh, I found that really hard to understand. I couldn't really understand why more people, especially in the media, weren't really exercised about this because to me, uh, the evidence was overwhelming. And this is the thing. The evidence was overwhelming 20 years ago for anybody paying attention. And uh, and somehow maybe it's the inertia in the system, whatever you want to call it. I think as well, part of the problem was that there, I think it wasn't in our faces, right? It was still seemed hypothetical and theoretical. Yeah. And it was always that, you know, if, if we don't do something now in the future, bad things will happen or bad things will happen somewhere else in the future. And that's sort of two degrees of separation. I think that allowed us to continue to believe that this was really some somebody else's problem for some other time. And I honestly, and then other things happened, like the, the big crash of 2008, 2009. There was a huge, I suppose, inward looking phase because we had, you know, if you go back to 2007, we had the IPCC's fourth assessment report, which was very influential. A lot of media pick up, a lot of everything. But that kind of died on the, on, on the vine, really, you know, from 2008 onwards because local, domestic, pressing issues you know they, they, they say it's often a tension between yeah. you know trying to deal with the end of the world and the end of the month right <laughs> and the end of the month that, that grappling with economics that is the front of people's minds understandably they're paying bills they're worried about their mortgage they're worried about you know their house being repossessed or they don't have a house or they, don't, they can't get an apartment those kind of you know sort of front of mind uh, issues as they pressed on us. I think the the climate thing fell away and it it fell away for years, to be honest. It it really, it kind of fell into a ditch and it stayed there for a long, long time. And I think it it has taken reality to put it back on the agenda again. And and by by which I mean just crushing weather disasters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, it seems like uh, the pandemic was another kind of jolt where I think there was a lot of momentum around the IPCC report 2018 everything it felt like there was just a really positive drive and then pandemic struck and suddenly the conversation shifts and people start you know there's only so many things human beings can worry about and stay stay sane at the same time you know um but i mean the thing that really fascinates me and i i personally struggle with so much is 
it, it's just sort of, I suppose, it's like the, the, the crisis of imagination, you know, really trying to figure out what what this is all going to turn into because, you know, I've, I think I, I sort of accepted this reality and started off on my own career trying to, to just sort of make that my career. Um, but I still, I think on a personal level, struggle to just, to really feel the, the, the fear because you keep kind of just getting distracted and you keep going back into, um, you know, wishful thinking a, a lot of the time as well. Um, I, I'm curious if you have, you know, a picture in your mind of, you know, sort of a visceral picture maybe of what the world is, is going to look like in, in the near future that keeps the fire burning for you to keep speaking about it because it must be exhausting having this conversation and, and being being this sort of advocate um, for, for you know, every minute of every day, basically. You know, I'm, I'm just curious if you, if there's something that you see that really kind of stokes that, that fire, that passion to keep on speaking about it. Yeah, I think you've put it incredibly well there in saying that um, it's just so hard to hold this in your mind because, first of all, life gets in the way. And second of all, we have kind of psychological damping systems designed mm. to protect our our, our, <laughs> our our well-being that sort of shut down almost excess levels of sort of uh, anxiety. And so they tend to get muffled, especially when the anxiety is about the future. Anxiety about the present is very easy. You know, if, if, <laughs> if the house catches fire, your anxiety levels uh, skyrocket. That's a good thing to get you out of the house. But worrying about your house being on fire in 15 years that's exhausting, yeah. right? Worrying about everybody's house being on fire in 15 years, yeah, that wears you down. So it is hard, and I think it's entirely understandable, and I think exactly as you described it, you know, folks like us, we zone in and we zone out. Uh, some days, some weeks, I can throw myself into this. Other times, you have to kind of crawl, you know, away from it a bit and just, just reset your batteries and mm. kind of reload to come back to it again because I can't do this all the time uh, because it is emptying. And you asked me the question, you know, what what picture do I see in my mind? Uh, yeah, um, it's, it's pretty dystopian, I'm not going to lie. Uh, and yet, uh, my experience over the arc of my own life has been of, you know, things getting steadily better all the time, you know, mm. from from kind of childhood into, you know, in, in young adults and into my working life and so on. You know, it has been a, a progression, a so-called career progression. The norm, the, in other words, the normal stuff. And even my experience over, over uh, my lifetime of Ireland getting so much better, mm. um, the you know, becoming a much more tolerant, a much wealthier country uh, and, and, and a country that, you know, is almost unrecognisable from the Ireland that I grew up in. So it is, this is the cosmic dissonance mm. going on here, where on the one hand, my senses are telling me that things are getting better and your intellect is telling you, actually, no, it isn't because mm. you read, you study, you observe and you pay attention to the bigger picture. But it's so easy to be to be beguiled by your senses. Yeah. Now, having said that, um, it's, it's pretty clear that the weather patterns in Ireland are shifting as well. But so far, in ways that are discomforting rather than catastrophic. So mm -hmm. you look at countries like, I mean, extreme examples like Pakistan, um, where you, you lurch from, you know, kill, killer heat waves in March, April to killer floods a few months later. Now, these are countries that have long suffered from weather extremes, so it's important to preface that. But... What's happening there is they're tilting from from difficult uh, environments to nigh on impossible environments. And I think we're going to follow that arc where we move out of our kind of climate safe zone and into much more difficult future. And mm -hmm. in Ireland, that will manifest itself, I think, as uh, increasing droughts, particularly on the East Coast, leading to really serious problems for agriculture, really serious problems. And what we're finding is that our weather patterns are shifting towards dry summers, and wetter winters. Wetter winters mean more flooding, more inundation. Drier summers mean big problems with food production. For a country like Ireland, those two things uh, are are big problems. Now, that's before you add in things like sea level rise and coastal inundation that is going to become an issue, certainly in the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years, like big time. Yeah. And I suppose there's, there's a bunch of other unknowns in terms of, you know, feedback loops, um, you know the, the the displacement of people and how that could you know uh, have a ripple effect. It's, it's very hard to predict, I suppose, how those things will will go. Um, you know, going back to, to what you mentioned about sort of the challenging your intellect, um, it, it is it, it is a test of sort of the rational mind versus sort of the emotional side of the brain or or, or whatever that is. Um, and 
um, uh, it was Ray on the on the last panel made the point about how you know we we declared the climate and biodiversity crisis, but we're not acting like it's a crisis, um, and how that undermines the idea of a crisis. Um, in contrast, we had the crisis of the pandemic, and everyone okay it didn't last forever. People got got frustrated, but in that in that immediate first couple of months, there was a willingness to respond to a crisis. You know, um, and and I'm, I'm I suppose part of the challenge to me feels like we need to stay in that mindset uh you know kind of keep keep the idea of a crisis um alive even though we're, we're relying on the rational uh, mind to do it um but that's a really tough challenge of of communication fundamentally i think and and you know what what you're doing on a on a on a daily basis is trying to persuade people to think that way um i'm curious if you feel like there's a particular argument you can make or or something that you've you've done over and over again that just helps kind of helps people tap into that mindset you know more so than others um does anything kind of come to mind yeah i suppose i've i've tried every trick at least every trick in my book i'm sure there are plenty of other tricks that i haven't tried but i have tried every technique that i can think of to try and if you like scale this in a way that people can get their heads and their hands around it i think it's so difficult when you start talking about global challenges and global crisis and global warming people's natural reaction to that is to kind of glaze over Mm -hmm. and you go "Ah, it's on it's on a scale that's beyond imagination it's beyond comprehension to think of a global crisis so so i think the, the the focus on the global tends to have that deadening effect on our on our response it is also a kind of a debilitating because something on that scale well how can I deal with it and what can I do so it tends to to uh, instill or encourage a kind of a fatalism Mm -hmm. and fatalism is a problem here because um, you know while climate denial and climate inaction and refusal to engage with with reality is has been a huge problem over the last 20 years I'm now seeing fatalism creeping in Mm -hmm. uh, as an equally problematic reaction because Fatalism is very much like the evil twin of denial because both of them say, let's do nothing. They may have different rationale and different uh, kind of intellectual framing, but they both come down to the same thing. Either there's nothing happening, do nothing, or it's too late, do nothing. Mm. And I think neither of those positions is, is, is fully accurate. We're still in a zone, a, a rapidly shrinking zone, an opportunity zone, where actions that we take now will have consequences, either positive or negative, for centuries. And it is weird to be in this consequential moment where mm-hmm. the bubble is shrinking, the opportunity, the, 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 the time for, for in human intervention in the climate system is fading really fast. And yet, even talking about the climate system, it sounds like impossibly large scale. Mm-hmm. So I often try and I'll give you an example of, of a, a way that I try to make this more understandable to people. You know, you hear a phrase like, oh, the average surface temperature of the earth has increased by 1.2 degrees and people say but but it's ridiculous there's nothing i mean for goodness sakes it's it's 10 degrees warmer at at lunchtime in ireland than it is you know at midnight so how can this possibly be a thing so i try to translate that into a human terms and say you take your body's core temperature is about 37 degrees every healthy human pretty much everywhere in the world uh, is about 37 degrees. That's their internal temperature. Mm. And it's, it's it's set for our species. And that temperature is is basically hardwired into us. And if you move out of that zone, uh, let's say, you know, you, your body temperature increases by one and a half, two degrees, you're in big trouble. Mm. And unless you can get it back down again, um, basically your, your, your internal ecology, if I can put it that way, is designed around 37 degrees. And if that changes, basically your organs start to fail, and uh, and you well you die. So you, you go to A and E. You know, I mean, it, oh, of course, it, of course, exactly. you take intervention. Yeah. But but I'm saying if you fail, if your fever continues 37, yeah. 38, 39, 40, basically, you know, uh, unless that's managed, you're done for. And that's a way for me to. And I've certainly seen people. I think I've seen the penny drop with people when I frame it in terms of, of, of a scale that they can they can relate to, which is the human body. And then kind of think of us almost as a microcosm of the global, um, the biosphere, right? Mm. Because in a sense, they're both complex closed systems that operate within well-known tolerance ranges. And you push either of those outside of those tolerance ranges and very bad things happen. So that would be one of my uh, toolkit, if you like, yeah. one, one, one method that I use to try to make this uh, in what I hope is a way that regular uh, 
people maybe coming to this maybe from 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 a, a point of, of limited kind of previous engagement can kind of take that away and think about it and go, oh, OK, I can kind of, I get that yeah. because I'm very aware that I can throw out science to beat the band and I can I can rattle off stats on all manner of things, uh, parts per million and yeah, exactly. you name it. And I appreciate that these can feel alien and maybe even a little debilitating when they're kind of being machine gunned at people, right? Yeah. Uh, and... So that's why I try to find in the language that I use ways that people can kind of form a mental picture of what I'm talking about Mm -hmm. rather than because I and I think it's often been said the you know, science communication on this issue is super difficult. For years, we talked about uh, polar bears balancing on ice flows. And what we know about that is that is not very effective because very few of us encounter polar bears in our lives, Uh, maybe in, in Dublin Zoo when you were a kid. Yep. But basically, they're not part of our reality. So when you frame climate change in terms of things that people can't relate to, then you've got a problem. And I'll give you, a, if I can scale that back, say, to an Irish context or a British context, um, during the summer, as we saw extreme heat wave conditions rolling into, well, certainly across Europe and even deep into Britain, uh, newspapers, uh, broadcast media, still using pictures of people at the beach. With eating their ice creams. Yeah. Eating ice creams and having a nice time. Uh, and I think we need to think about the imagery and the way that we communicate this really serious climate shift and the tendency. And of course, again, it's a normal tendency. Ireland is a northern hemisphere. We're quite a northerly country and we're quite a cool country. And therefore, our first experience of global warming is a positive experience. It's a bit like the the, the, the frog in the um, in the pan, mm. right? Initially, as the pan begins to warm, the frog thinks, gosh, this is rather nice, mm-hmm. right? Now, we all know how that story ends. We, we hope we do anyway. The frog jumps out of the pan. But the point is, initially, our, our first impact with climate change, if you like, in Ireland has been, ironically, has been a positive one. Unfortunately, that turns from positive to, to deeply negative really quickly. And mm-hmm. I think we're seeing that already. And it plays out in sort of the 1.5 degrees, 2, two degrees. I mean, I, I think for a long time, and going back to kind of uh, when I first came across your writing on this, it was a lot of the, the conversation around climate change was like, actually, climate change would be great for Ireland. You know, there's still that kind of element of like, we could do with a couple more degrees, you know. And whereas the, you know, the um, body temperature uh, analogy is a very different, uh, that, that tunes into a different part of the brain entirely. So I think I think that makes a lot, an awful lot of sense. Um just g- going into, I mean, um, obviously we're, we're mainly talking about food, you know, uh, in, in the course of this podcast and, and uh, in the festival. Um, I'd love to know, I mean, I think, I'd love to, I suppose, know your sense of what the solution looks like, maybe in 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 a bit more concrete terms or something like that, because I, I, I you know, I think we've been talking about um, the macro side of things and, and I'm obviously conscious of um, how how that change could roll out. So do do you have a sort of a sense of when it comes to Irish food, you know, what is the what is the picture that we're that we're driving towards and what are the immediate sort of is there kind of a step by step process that you would follow if if you were the minister for everything as you mentioned earlier um to 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 bring that to life. Yeah, I I use that analogy because um I'm really concerned about food security in Ireland. The longer I've been at this the more concerned I am. And I think we could face hunger on this island much sooner than anybody imagines. And I think this threat is not being taken seriously at all. I think we're in a, a state of denial and, and and delusion, to be honest with you, about, about food. We're still selling uh, fairy tales about feeding millions of people abroad, which is simply not the case. And I really <laughs> wish our politicians would just stop it, just stop it and be honest about the situation. And OK, that's your favourite system. You're, we've we've built this export oriented um, system, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But you have to recognise that that was in a best of all worlds scenario. Never when we were constructing that export based uh, high emissions, uh, high value system, did anybody seriously think that we could be looking at a a situation where we have to actually consider core food security on our island. And I believe that that's to me is, you know, we're we're facing into a winter of an energy crisis. And I think uh, just behind the energy crisis is the food crisis. 
And I think we're so much closer to this than people imagine. And they say that civilization is three meals deep. Now things, you know, you get breakdown in your food systems and basically the whole house of cards comes tumbling down much more quickly than people think. Mm. Whole societies panic when there's a food crisis, especially societies like ours that have no lived experience of genuine shortages. I mean, genuine society-wide shortages. And I, I remember, I live in Dunleary most of the time, and I remember this kind of came home to me. Uh, there was a Marks and Spencer's on the main street in Dunleary, and I was walking past there one morning, and the sign, the shop was closed, and the sign said, um, shop empty due to bad weather in the Irish Sea. Really? Everything in the shop that morning basically was coming in uh, at the time on a ferry into, into Dunleary. And it was the so-called just-in-time um, delivery mm. system. And it just occurred to me, wow, bit of weather in the Irish Sea, nothing in your supermarket. Now, so much of our food system is, is, is inscrutably complex along long uh, supply chains that are looped inside other supply chains connected to other supply chains. And they're almost unknowably complex. And these are chains about which we, we barely understand and over which we have no control at all. We are, we're at the end of these chains. And to me, that's a really scary place for a country to be. I, you know, what I, my vision as a, my Minister for Everything vision is that we need to make um, securing the food supply on the island of Ireland a number one political economic mm. uh, endpoint, say by 2030. That would be my food vision 2030. Yeah. That's interesting because it takes the focus off sort of the emissions conversation. Mm. And it's just, but it would, if it would achieve the same end results, wouldn't it? I mean, you'd be talking about, you know, in some, is it about, you know, changing um, how subsidies are, are, um, are delivered towards more horticulture, more tillage, uh, as we kind of talked about earlier today, because you're just trying to diversify what's produced in Ireland. In the process, you then have a more diverse um, emissions profile uh, because you're not, it's not, it's not so heavily one-sided towards uh, towards livestock. That's right. I mean, yeah. our system here, we have doubled down basically on a ruminant-based livestock system. And, um, you know, if you would, sorry, if our national policy was to produce the least amount of food for the most emissions, this is what you would do, mm. right? And this is where we're at. Yet this seems logical. And of course, this is making money for certain people. But at huge environmental cost in terms of... Uh, water pollution, air pollution, biodiversity loss, uh, and of course, our absolutely oversized contribution to the global emissions crisis. We know, for example, methane levels globally have trebled over the last 100 years. And the largest single source globally of these methane emissions is the livestock sector. And Ireland is a grossly oversized contributor for a small country to that. And methane as we know, is an extremely potent, shorter acting, but incredibly potent greenhouse gas, uh, 80 times more potent than CO2 over a 20 year time period. And we're in the crunch period. And the quickest way that uh, we can, if you like, take some of the pressure off the global climate system while we figure out the tougher job of decarbonizing is to cut down on methane. Because when you cut down methane, within a decade, you get the cooling effect of reducing methane. But we've done precisely the opposite. We have added 500,000 dairy cows to our so-called national herd over the last eight or nine years. And each of those dairy cows, to, to put this in context, uh, eight dairy cows produce one ton of methane. So you divide 500,000 by eight, and uh, that's something of the order of... Uh, What's that? Oh, don't challenge but, me. Yeah, it's yeah. about, about 60,000 tonnes right. of methane, additional tonnes of methane a mm -hmm. year. Then you multiply those 60,000 tonnes by 80 to give you the CO2 effect. And you see what we're talking about. This is a massive impact, mm -hmm. really serious at the very worst possible time as we're trying to get emissions down. And the old excuse, we're too small here in Ireland, I, you know, that is the greatest cop out there's ever been, you know. Rather than saying, well, you know, and I've heard this so many times in so many forums saying, oh, well, you know, why should we do anything? You know, those Chinese are building coal fired plants yeah. and the, the Brazilians are adding more cattle. Well, first of all, that 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 argument, uh, we're the rich country. We're far richer per capita than China or Brazil or, or m most other places in the world. So 
the richest world, we've been the biggest contributor to the problem and we have to take the biggest hit, according to climate justice, to, to, to ramp the uh, emissions down. So it is an unacceptable cop-out to say that a small country like Ireland is, is that what we do is irrelevant. I mean, if you t- take a province in China with five million people, should they get a free pass too because there's only five million of them? I think it's fundamentally un-Irish to take that um, perspective because we're our whole sort of psyche is built around being the underdog. We punch above our weight. We're all over the world. You know, there's 70 million people everywhere. You know, we influence, you know, uh, sport, culture, music way beyond, uh, you know, um, what we ought to given our size. So it, it does feel like a bit of a pick and choose situation there where we, we could take the opposite view. We could say we're going to lead out. We're going to be trailblazers in this. And, you know, we are a smaller country. We should be able to our super tanker, you know, to borrow an, an, an analogy from earlier is a little bit smaller than it's a lot smaller than China's you know so if we want to fair enough that's a very different political situation maybe it's e- quicker to turn that super tank around yeah. actually than Ireland but we should be able to change faster than others because we are a fairly unified country in, in most respects I mean I think in response to, <clears throat> again to to the pandemic there was an awful lot of unity you know we were um, we were uh, there, there was no polarisation there was very little polarisation when it came to vaccines for example you know we 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 we, we buy into things, I think, uh, relatively harmoniously. Compare that to, you know, take the states, for example. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're nowhere near as, as polarised as that. There is polarisation in, in the sort of food and agriculture um, debate, um, which, you know, like any type of polarisation could get toxic uh, if it's not already. It could, it could worsen that way. But, I mean, I think your, your reframing of the challenge around let's cut down emissions to let's become diversely food secure by 2030 that feels to me like something that could unify everyone around a kind of a common goal that has a national pride sort of element to it. Um, do you, do, is that realistic, do you think? Do you think we could actually sort of stop arguing about, well, not that we'd stop arguing about emissions, but that we would focus in a different direction maybe and with that, um, do you think we could actually create a different narrative around what we're trying to do when it comes to the food we produce here? Um, or does that feel just... I don't know, too difficult to introduce a, a new a new kind of national story about food. Well, I think that there has been a shift. I know certain people are making an awful lot of noise, but I'll give you an example. The National Dairy Council, which works and is funded by uh, the agriculture sector. So, <laughs> right, when I quote their statistics, you can take it that it's from from their perspective. But they did a survey last year that found that one in three of the Irish public no longer trust or say they do not trust dairy farmers when it comes to the environment. One in three. And this is an industry that we have pumped billions into. Mm. It's an industry that we've almost defined ourselves around. And yet the National Dairy Council, their own organisation, finds huge levels of public mistrust in what's going on. And obviously the incident that came to light last week um, where 400 calves or so were found uh, dead in the most gruesome circumstances and that is not the first instance. We had a similar one of these a few months back. Um, It's obvious that we have a massive welfare issue on top of a massive emissions issue on top of a massive pollution issue. Now you put all these together and this puts farmers feeling on the back foot and feeling persecuted. And I've tried to make the point and I'll make it again today This is not about individual farmers being, you know, setting out to make Ireland a worse place. This is about people responding rationally to irrational market signals. Mm. And I gave the example earlier of uh, farmers being financially penalised for not clearing scrubland and wasteland and ponds on their land. This is nuts. We should be paying, if a farmer has five acres of scrubland on their land, we should be paying them twice to preserve that, like twice the amount that they're getting for farming regular land, because that is providing absolutely critical biodiversity uh, and ecological protection services. But we haven't valued these things. We've allowed the market, the so-called market, to set the values instead. And of course, there is no kind of people kind of tend to to genuflect uh, at the market, the so-called market. But our market is already full of of all kinds of incentives. We put billions of euros of subsidies into certain food production systems. For example, we put very little money in Ireland into organic food systems because that isn't where the big PLCs are interested in. They want to sell, they want to buy cheap from farmers and sell it on to the supermarkets. They're not interested in boutique 
products like, well, as they would see it, boutique products like organic agriculture, because they want they want a big scale, you know, fill up the tanker, fill up the, the, the ship and ship it off. So it's the old Ben Dunn thing of, mm. of uh, what is stack it high and sell it cheap. That's their model. And I mean, if, if the sort of crux of the solution is to just change the subsidies, that seems like a pretty straightforward, you know, on paper um, solution. Um, is it vested interests in your mind that prevent that from happening? Is it just a more general inertia and a kind of a fear of change? Um, what what it, it just seems to me like kind of an easy one, you know, and I don't know why we're not talking more about that. And and um, and it's just not like that specifically isn't being that it feels to me like that's not the center of the national conversation around food. It's like, let's mm. change the subsidies. It's it's more let's cut the national herd or let's you know what I mean? It, it just it, it feels like it's framed in the wrong way. And I don't know why that is. Yeah, I think I think the protecting of the of the existing status quo is is powerful. I mean, there there are folks who are fighting tooth and nail to make sure that this system persists for as long as it possibly can, and that's understandable because they have a lot of uh, money invested in this particular model. And for again, for a small number of big players, this is a very lucrative model. Now, it may be bad for Ireland's. Um, biosphere, it may be bad for our biodiversity, it may be bad for our water quality, it may be bad for our emissions profile but it's very good for some people and so understandably and those people tend to be very powerful people with uh, deep pockets and with ready access to uh, the levers of politics and in some cases also to the levers of media. Mm. These are very powerful interests and again I'm not trying to play the conspiracy card here. These interests are well known and well understood. This isn't some sinister cabal. These are multinational PLCs doing what they do which is basically using their power to to bend the market to their will. That's how these large organisations work. They use their lobbying power, they use their marketing power, they use their 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 gravity their, their, their scale to basically push the market in the direction that they want the market to go. And it's very difficult. The opposition to them is scattered and dispersed. You know, you've got a few organic people here, you've got a couple of environmentalists there, you've got a, a few NGOs over there. It's a very, very scattered, very poorly poorly financed and, and, and l- with limited organisation. And what I find extraordinary is how effective that sort of um, very, very arbitrary defence or, or, or other side, if I can put it that way, how unbelievably effective they've been, I think, in changing the argument in Ireland over the last few years. Because I think the the, the industrial monolith of, say, the, the, the untrammeled dairy expansion, I think a lot of people are really, and as I said, the NDC figures would indicate that. And I think when that study is done again, I think that that one third could be could be significantly higher the next time. I think people are beginning to realise that what we need to focus on is, uh, well, I hope anyway, they're beginning to think about that we need to focus on food security, that we need to focus on, um, I guess, what it, what works best, not just for making money, but what is, the, what is the best answer for Ireland? What's the best way that we can progress? And that has to include, uh, you know, we're not going anyplace unless we have a functioning unless nature continues to exist and to function in Ireland. And the only way we can do that is, I think, in Ireland, we're going to have to rewild some of our land. Some of this, by the way, would be super easy to do. For example, it, would, it wouldn't take more than a few million quid to buy off the, the hill farmers of Ireland, uh, say the sheep farmers who are, who are grazing on the hills. They're already heavily subsidised with their sheep. Now, you buy, I mean, in my Minister of Everything vision, I would uh, pay them, to switch role to get the sheep off the hills, uh, compensate them in full, and then pay them some more to basically be custodians of those same hillsides. And let. And by the way, we don't need Quilcher or anybody else up there planting trees. They, they just create havoc. What you do instead is you allow nature to recover. You keep the herbivores off the hills and the mountains and nature will recover. We've seen this all over the place. Um, Owen Dalton, uh, has the environmentalist, has a book coming out uh, shortly, in fact, where he explores doing exactly this work in the Bera Peninsula. One man taking it on as a project. And the, 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 the reinvigoration of an, of an Atlantic rainforest because Ireland should be a lush uh, temperate rainforest. That is our natural condition. People drive out to the to the wilderness, say up the Dublin mountains, the Wicklow mountains, and they say, my God, it's amazing up here. It's so beautiful. It's so rugged. 
it's a moonscape. There's nothing much alive up there because it has been grazed by herbivores to destruction. Now, you might say, but herbivores are natural. But sure, how can, what can, harm can they be doing? In nature, the herbivores would be being herded and hunted by carnivores. But of course, we don't like carnivores. So we've killed off all the all the predators of the herbivores. So so we our deer population should be being harried by wolves or by lynxes or whatever. And obviously we don't like uh, rival predators, so we've mm. killed them all off. And that means that our herbivores basically are left to roam the places where our machines can't get to. Mm. So so that's just somewhere you could start really effectively to say right. We will use financial instruments. We will withdraw subsidies from things that do colossal damage. And by the way, the, the farmers in question, they're not making money out of this. They're, they're, they, I think one of our farmers in the panel spoke about this earlier, that uh, a single acre of mountainy land might support one lamb. In other words, you're making about 50 euros an acre. Now, the, the destruction of that land for such a, minuscule return makes no sense at all yeah. and I, I almost think it's an ideological thing that it's my right I've got commonage I should do it and I just think we need to turn that thinking around mm. and what we want to focus on instead is custodianship many farmers and I grew up on a farm so I know a little bit about this many farmers are clo- consider themselves to be close to the land and are interested in the land and are interested to some extent in nature some, some aren't by the way <laughs> to be clear about this but many are and I think they need to be encouraged, identified, rewarded and incentivized to do it. And this false farmers hate nature and environmentalists are fighting with them all the time. I think it's a horrible narrative. Mm. There are many farmers who must be deeply insulted by the idea that they're the enemies of nature. So I think, and yet at the same time, that does not give anybody a free pass to, 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 be, to be destroying it. But it merely says that we need to have dialogue and conversation that reflects the fact that some people are trying to help some people are not trying to help and to reward incentivize those people and to it's those conversations I think that start to turn this thing around mm. and it, uh, that example requires financial instruments from the state right um, that's not a kind of bottom up consumer demand you know s- solution um, which I suppose is often Come, you know, brought out as as you know the best approach is just well, let's all change our diets and let you know, everything everyone will kind of respond accordingly. Um, I, I'm curious what you think it, the role is of, of of that. You know, how how much of an impact would it be if consumer demand for um, for beef in Ireland fell off a cliff, or, or you know, it, it, in some respects that's part of the solution, but it could also be quite damaging because you're not controlling the transition. Then you're potentially putting farmers at, at greater risk rather than just as you say, you know, um, a, a different method of subsidy could could avoid that potentially. Okay, I mean, if we use market instruments um, the way effectively, then one of those market instruments is is the simple principle, which is the polluter pays principle. Certain types of agriculture are very um, light on pollution. Some are extremely heavy. Yet at the moment, we have no way of punishing one and rewarding the other. Mm. Now. New Zealand, for example, at the moment, another major agricultural country with major um, pollution and emissions problems arising from that, they're currently considering the step of introducing um, basically a methane tax on the dairy industry. Well, sorry, on on ruminant industry. And what that means basically is that farmers will be charged per tonne of methane that is emitted. So that means that the actual costs related to pollution start to be factored in. Now, you would hope as well that that money be ring-fenced and maybe used, for example, to support other forms of agriculture that are less damaging. What it should never be seen as, these taxes, is simply a smash and grab to take money from farmers. It should be, we've got different ways of producing food. At the moment, some of them are sky-high emissions, some of them are much lower. Now, we want to nudge the balance so that it's in farmers' own financial interest uh, to do the right thing. People will do the right thing given a chance. But if you create incentives for them to do the right thing, they will. But if the incentives are perverse, then they won't. And at the moment in Ireland, uh, the main support continues to flood in and flow in to livestock agriculture. That's, that's where we're at. And again, it's the large operators getting most of the 
of the of the the money as well and the smaller guys getting pushed out of it so how do we redress that balance how do we how do we square that up so that that uh, we come up with a system i would suggest that we tax high emissions um high emissions everything by the way we need to tax the hell out of high emissions vehicles like SUVs, just tax them off the road and use the money to support whether it's e-bikes or electric cars or electric vans, right? And this again is how you balance it up. You use the, the use the taxation system to say we want less of this and more of that. I mean, why do we tax cigarettes so heavily? We tax them because the state has to pick up the cost, the health costs of uh, smoking. So they say to the private sector that provides the cigarettes, well, we're going to hammer you for taxes. And that's that's life. Now, I think equally in any other area where you have a high emissions profile, like a super high emissions profile, the obvious thing to do would be to introduce a, a sliding tax. It doesn't, I don't mean this all happens tomorrow. You basically flag to people that over the next five, seven, ten years, we're introducing a sliding tax. We have it, for example, already with a general carbon tax, where that increases by, uh, I think it's seven euros fifty a year, every year until it gets to a hundred euros a ton, to reflect the societal cost of carbon emissions. Now, to tell you the truth, if we were super honest about the societal cost of carbon emissions, we might be charging a ten thousand euros a ton. That's in reality. If you factor the the damage done by a ton of carbon over the next thousand years, it's probably running into thousands of euros. But even at 100 euros, that sends a signal to the market that lower carbon options are better. Mm. And I think we can apply that as well to our food production system. And that means that would also, by the way, create a revenue stream. Without straining the public purse, it would create a revenue stream where we would be siphoning, drawing revenue away from the high emissions guys and pumping that revenue into the organic guys, into the horticulture sector to support them in low emissions food production. And that, to me, is how you would rebalance the scales. Mm. And I, I think there's still a role for consumer demand to to also signal interest in paying more for something or or trying something new, um, you know, say, for example, oat milk, you know, produced in Ireland, you know, just sp- like I personally buy both milk and oat milk and I use oat milk for cereal and I use milk in my tea and coffee, you know, and, and very quickly you can cut your milk in half. And on the one hand, you know, then you need to uh, address the balance of the, the dairy farmers. Um, on the other hand, you're also showing there's there's an opportunity for the, the domestic oat milk market to grow, you know, potentially. Um I'm curious if, if, you know, for yourself, um, you know, as a as an eater, as we all are, and someone who uh, is an Irish male and, you know, probably grew up drinking pints of milk and eating um, steaks and sausages and everything else, um, you know, how, how have you sort of, uh, you know, kind of looked at your own diet and, and how how's that been for you? Because, it, it, I mean, it's such an entrenched um, part of your life and, you know, it becomes so habitual and everything else. I'm curious if if there's anything in particular that, that you've sort of adopted and that you might recommend as well. Yeah, I mean, I'll start exactly where, where you start, and that is uh, oat milk. It is the easiest, most painless transition going. Um, I find um, I'm not 100% oat milk because, you know, the different people in my household and, you know, everybody has their own preferences. But I found that um, oat milk was like switching from Heineken to Guinness. A um, little bit of a Different taste, yeah. A different taste, but once you got used to the flavour, there's mm-hmm. no going back. I mean, I find oat milk, for example, Flahavans do a great a great uh, oat milk, and it's an organic oat milk, and it's creamy, strangely enough. It has a nice creamy flavour. I actually like it in tea as well, mm. and cereal. So that's a really easy one. And the, the emissions uh, impact, the positive emissions impact there is colossal. And, and also... Oftentimes in Ireland, when when you hear people, you know, giving out about oat milk or sorry, giving out about fake milks, as they call them, they don't talk about oat milk. Amazingly enough, they want Mm. to talk about almond milk because it's something that happens in California and uses a vast amount of water. Now, if you want to have a discussion about milk and its alternatives in Ireland, let's talk about cow's milk versus oat milk because we can produce it here so well. Uh, But I find that the folks having this discussion, I remember a a Minister for Agriculture giving out about um, almond milk in the doll one day and I was thinking to myself, why almond? Why did you pick that? Because, uh, so I think they're the kind of shifts you can do and you're absolutely right. I grew up in a farming background, uh, steaks when, you know, and, and milk and all the rest of, and I've been a lifelong milk drinker. Right, uh, always enjoyed a glass of milk, and 
so that that shift, if you like, that dietary shift from from milk uh, to oat milk for me was very very straightforward. Um, struggling a little bit with vegetarianism, mm. I still like um, meat. I avoid red meat, so I tend to eat chicken. It, emissions wise, it's vastly lower than than um, either beef or lamb or um, pork. Vastly lower. So it is okay. I appreciate there are ethical issues with with uh, chickens as well, but uh, if you focus more on the emissions and the impact side, chicken is a relatively low, relatively low impact. Still not as low as 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 uh, uh, non non meat, but it's it's kind of on the way if you like. Uh, would I like to completely eliminate meat from my diet? I would, but uh, you know I'm. It's hard. It's hard. I'm, yeah. I'm at this We're a long time. Yeah. And I'm hardwired. Also, it means when you're on social occasions, as often you go to restaurants and things, and the vegetarian options are rubbish. One, I have two daughters. One of them is a vegetarian, the younger one. And this was her call, uh, I guess. I'm not quite sure what was the moment for her. But she's three years vegetarian now, and she absolutely is committed to it. Mm. It's what she wants, and she, she'll never go back. And so that's one of two. Um... The other is a carnivore. So I guess it's very much uh, their own decision and their own business, to be honest. Um, so for me, yeah, I I don't think I'll ever be a vegan, for example. I, I think I would I would struggle with that. I, I, I like I like cheese, for example. But I'm there's lots of aspects of the dairy industry that I'm not that happy about, mm. that a lot of people are not that happy about. Uh, but I'm afraid... Like like other people, I hold my nose and continue to to you know I guess support that industry in in different ways, uh, as as probably most of us do. Um, I think we are going to have to transition towards um, much lower, um, and it isn't just about emissions because emissions again can sound so abstract, yeah. but it's really impact. We need to go towards low impact foods, and in Ireland we know that we can produce vegetables very well. Um, not on all of our ground, but in a lot of it. And a lot of the land that we can produce vegetables on, in my book, and I did allude to this earlier, we need to be looking at rewilding. And I know that's considered to be a, a dirty word and, and, you know, oh, Eamon Ryan and his wolves, all this nonsense. It's, it's reality, right? And people need to stop scoffing and start getting serious about what rewilding means and why it is something that we are going to depend upon to save our bacon in mm-hmm. the end of the day. Because without functioning ecosystems, our goose is cooked. So this is where people who think that people promoting rewilding are, you know, airy, fairy, green types, they're missing the point. Rewilding is essential to allow the the natural world to not collapse. Mm. When the natural world collapses, well, then it's taking us with it. So for me, that's why I'm prepared to, to, to think of all options, including pretty radical options, because if we allow the natural world to effectively cease to function, it doesn't mean all life on Earth will end, but it means all life relevant to us will end. And again, we sit at the apex of the global food system. That food system will collapse and that will sweep away most of humanity with it. And this is something that people need to get through to. They need to get their heads around that it isn't environmentalism, isn't some niche pastime. It is fundamental to whether or not we have a future and not this century but in the next several years to couple of decades it's all on the table right now absolutely everything so I often think people kind of when I set out stuff like this people say oh it's very radical John very radical I say really you think so so you think throwing the dice and just continuing to heat up the planet that's sensible but but trying to stabilize the biosphere that's radical I said no 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 I think you're the radical mm. I, 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 I'm a small c conservative I want to conserve what we have protect our ecosystems uh, and that makes me the conservative not the radical That was an absolutely fascinating conversation. I think John really was a voice in the wilderness for a long, long time on this issue. And as it's moved centre stage, he is still one of the best communicators on environmental topics that we have in this country. Huge thanks to John and to Barry for taking part in this episode. 
Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a million for listening and please come back for the next episode of Food Done Right.